What's up, mates? We're back. Another episode. Today we're going to be doing styrofoam. Now, I have this pre-shredded up styrofoam because it was actually just styrofoam that I had laying around my house before I even built the reactor that I needed just, you know, to be shredded because it was taking up too much bloody space, the fat little... I'm watching my mouth there, but... <laughs> anyways, let's go ahead and weigh this. Um, I already have the scale zeroed out. This is a whole trash bag full of this stuff. We know it's very light, it's mostly air, so I'm not expecting much. We are at one pound and seven ounces. I'm gonna do all the conversions myself manually this time, because this dang scale is hard to reach. Not much at all, but this does take up a lot of volume despite that. So now we're gonna go ahead and get these catalysts in here, right? So like I said in my last video, we're still in the experimental side of things. So I'm just gonna do equal weight of catalyst to plastic. Now I know of course this will be a very small amount of catalyst in proportion to how much plastic there is since styrofoam is so non-dense but for now I feel like this is the best I can do. 1.07 perfect. So that's how much carbon we're gonna add that amount there. This little bag compared to all of this styrofoam. Let's go on to the next catalyst. We just got a bucket. Wonder what's inside. Crack cocaine, baby. Yes. This is the next catalyst. Crack cocaine. Um, this actually gets the plastic high. When the plastic is high, it's easier to manipulate it to break down. Calcium oxide. The same thing people put on their fertilizer. Now this is alkaline. And what this does is it reacts with any potential acidic formulations within the plastic so if there's any like sulfur dioxide sulfur anything it's going to react with it neutralize it absorb to it blah 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 so it's a great thing to add and it does more than that too but that's the basic that's the most useful part in my opinion of what the lime does 1.07 baby I'm on fire I'm on fire look at that so that much lime and there's one last catalyst that I like to add that I didn't add in my last video. And that is this right here. Kitty litter clay. This adsorbs to some contaminants as well. I don't really know exactly what it does exactly. But in the past when I've added it, I've always had, you know, positive benefits like higher oil yields, etc. So we're gonna add 0 0.07 pounds of clay. Now this clay, kind of like the carbon, is dense. And by the way, I didn't mention it, but the carbon, for all the new people, the carbon allows plastic to absorb microwaves. Because plastic on its own will not break down in a microwave environment. That's, that's why you can actually put plastic covers in your microwave, and they will not break down and turn into fuel. Because you don't have it like I have it. You don't have a catalyst in here. Right, hold on. Does that... Let's make sure we're out of pounds here. Chloe, get out the goddamn luck. Everything in here weighs 1.08 pounds. I'll do the conversion to kilograms for all my science people. My science people. Now we're going to go ahead and mix it all up in here. Like we're making a soup. Oh yeah, times four. Okay, it's four pounds. Four... 4.26 pounds. So, alright, we're gonna go ahead and start loading it up with the styrofoam. Angle everything, like, I'm trying not to spill it everywhere. I'm gonna have to end up closing this door so we don't leak anymore. Got the plastic in there. It makes some horrifying noises. What happens is, if you didn't notice, when this is going in reverse, eventually it'll all build up right here and it'll get like stopped. It'll get cock blocked, so then I have to put it forward. But when I have it going forward, it moves the stuff towards the end. And if it reaches too far at the end, it can no that stuff at right back here can no longer come back because it just reaches the end of the, the cap versus if it's up back here it can always come forward. 
So I know that's an engineering thing I need to deal with. And on top of that, if it re if let's say like majority of the cyclone reaches down here, only one magnetron has coverage of this area. So it, it's, it kind of messes up everything. We want maximum coverage. So ideally we want an even spread across the whole zone. That's why I go backwards more than I go forward because we can always bring it forward if we go backwards. We can't always bring it backwards if we go too far forward. As you saw, some of it was falling out. So I had to close the cap. That whole bag... Pretty much one whole trash bag represents the maximum volume that this reactor can have at one time because I would say that, you know, this thing is pretty filled, packed up with the styrofoam to the very top there. Um, we really can tell if I go forward for a little bit um, by about how much it, it comes down. And yeah, it's really staying at that same level. So this is pretty much the maximum capacity, but a whole bag, a whole trash bag worth of plastic is actually a decent amount. Um, in my opinion, so I'm happy with that volume for this reactor for this size. So let's get started. Okay, so we have this argon going for a little bit. Let's hear it. All right, so there's some pressure building up. Let's do the little flame check. I do should not be lasting like that. It should be going out. So yeah, we look. You you see, it's actually a little bit flammable. So I'm glad we do this argon check because clearly. There's still some flammable vapors in there from the last run. We need to make sure all the air is out for safety. Right, so it's been quite some time. Flame not can't even light. You know what I'm saying? I can start the flame over here, move it in, it gets quenched. Argon environment. Um air tightness check. I guess probably that star from had a lot of air pockets in it individually, you know, because it's so porous and then it's has so much air in it to begin with that, you know, it just really took a lot of time to get all that air out all right as i said before we turn on the magnetrons at five minute interview intervals let's make sure everything works magnetron fan one works magnetron fan two works internal fans works water pump is it on yeah it's on magnetron one Check. Magnetron 2 or Transformer 2. Check. Transformer 3. Check. Transformer 2 actually just had a short. Listen. You hear that? So, you gotta open her up. You can see the top of it does have a bit of carbonization on it. So I think what happened is this was too close to the top of this and it arced through. I just want to remind everybody that right now this is the most dangerous part of this whole reactor right now. The singular, just one transformer is more dangerous than this thing exploding because this thing, you will instantly be gone if you touch that or if it touches you when it's on because that's usually how it works, right? So I always use this stick to even turn the, the switch on. So I'm already far away. So it actually turned out not to be one of the primary leads but one of the secondary leads. Uh, it was actually in contact with this metal which is um, the metal that holds the oil for the transformers. It, Here's the thing, guys. This voltage is so high, it pretty much jumps right through insulation, okay? It doesn't give a damn about it if it's close enough to metal. So it'll do the exact same to you. So don't ever touch it if it's on. Don't ever touch the wires. I don't care how insulated it is. I don't care if you have it triple insulated. I am so serious. When this is on, I never touch it. Not even with a stick. On. Magnetron 3. On. Starting the timer. Alright. Timer's on. We doing this. Pulling 18 amps right now, so the magnetron is on, it's confirmed. Six minutes in, let's check the temps and turn on the rest. 180 degrees Fahrenheit, one, uh, that's the external body temperature. 105 degrees Fahrenheit, that is the vapor temperature. Uh, Celsius, that is 83.5 degrees Celsius for the external body and 40.8 degrees Celsius for the vapor temperature. Let's go ahead and turn magnetron 2 on. All right, fan and transformer two is on. 20 minutes in, 21 to be exact. External body temperature, 455 degrees Fahrenheit. Almost 500 degrees in just 20 minutes. That is crazy. 112 degrees for the uh, the, the vapor temperature going to Fahrenheit. I mean Celsius. 236 degrees Celsius for the external body temperature already, and 44.8 degrees Celsius for the vapor temperature. So now we're gonna turn on the third magnetron. Yeah, that's right. It got this hot that quickly with just two on. Now we're turning on the third, let's do it. All right, third is on. I also wanted to show you guys 
that in the beginning, the first 20 to 30 minutes, the vapors that come out, it's mostly a lot of argon. You know, we pushed all that argon in. As you see, it doesn't hold a flame really, and um, it just kind of acts weird. But once it starts to hit like the 30 minute mark, then it will hit a, then it will develop a flame. Once it really starts to get hot in there, also, you know, some water vapor may be coming through, all that type of stuff, just in the beginning, for the first around 30 minutes. 30 minutes in, 574 degrees Fahrenheit, external body temperature, 131 degrees Fahrenheit, internal vapor temperature, 300 degrees Celsius, external body temperature, 555.6 degrees Celsius, internal vapor temperature. Yes, it is. See that flame? See that? Yep. It's fireable. Now we're going to agitate it for the first time. Now I'm recording just in case if this blows up. So I have an explosion on camera, which has been an issue I never had before. Not saying I want that to happen, but I'm just saying it, it could happen. So we're going to go... Let's go backwards for a little bit. Oh, uh, turn it off. <laughs> I'm kind of scared. I, get, I tell you, I'm scared every time I agitate it. Because I know when you agitate it, you're releasing any potential oxygen in there and you're also releasing a ton of the flammable vapors and you're also potentially causing sparks with the blades and the microwave so you're literally making the potential perfect environment for an explosion so it's scary but hey look at the flames coming off of that one <laughs> we are 55 56 minutes in check this out the external body temperature in just 56 minutes, less than an hour, is 813 degrees. The vapor temperature is 276 degrees. That's Fahrenheit. Going to Celsius now. 434 degrees Celsius external body temperature and 102 degrees Celsius internal vapor temperature. Very hot, very soon, very quickly. And I've been agitating it 30 seconds reverse. 10 seconds forward about every 10 minutes 10 to 15 minutes um i want to eventually get some type of arduino thing that will do that for me because obviously i'm not going to be here for the next five hours just sitting here you know it's going to be inconsistent agitation but you know i'm still going to do it every here here and there 800 degrees already not even an hour can a conventional pyrolysis machine even get up to that hot because that's just the external body temperature Imagine the surface level internal plastic temperature has to be at least in the thousands because that heat is then being transferred to the metal. So it has to be at least like a thousand degrees Fahrenheit or like what is that 500 degrees 5 to 550 degrees Celsius. It has to be no way. All right, so it's been two hours and seven minutes. Um, now you probably are wondering when you look at this side over here, Jab, why do you have two balls but one of them isn't full? I mean, the answer to that is so you can lick them both. Um, but actually, the reason why is because I had to go somewhere for about 30 minutes, and I did not want to risk this ball overfilling and either this bursting or something and here bursting or one of the pressure release valves going off. So I was like, okay, I'll just hook up another ball, completely empty ball, and just have that filled up because I can always transfer the vapors from here into here with the pump if I absolutely had to. As we see, the flame is pretty small, and, and I'm agitating it right now. And yet the flame is still this small. Compare that to the LDPE, the flame was literally all the way like out here. I'm, I was anyway, my observation was it does not produce as much gas. Produces more oil than gas. Um, more, more, most, more than likely. But even at that, we can't really compare this to the LDP run that much. Because it was two pounds of LDP, PE versus only one pound of styrofoam. But let's see how the gas is looking with it being agitated you know a it's a decent flame not bad you know definitely gas production but kind of trash if you ask me all right it's the next morning let's see the result So here we are. Um, when I opened it, there was some liquid that started falling out. As you can see, the base there, there is some liquid. What's interesting to me is, 
I haven't spun the blades yet, but it looks like there's absolutely no carbon in there. <laughs> like, I don't see any carbon. No, there is also, um, I can smell a gas coming out of this. This is that flammable gas, that pyrolysis gas. It kind of smells like styrofoam mixed with, like, gasoline. I probably, I shouldn't be breathing this in, but I'm going over here. So, you'll be breathing this in while I'm over here spinning these blades. Unfortunately, I can't get the carbon out. And I, now I did, I I did let this cool overnight, so it's possible the carbon just like formed some clumps, or s rocks, or some crap, you know, because it was just sitting there at like 600 something degrees for all that time, whatever. Uh, from this point forward, I think we'll run do six hour runs from now on, because if there is any actual styrofoam left in there, and that's the cause of this, obviously that means there's not a complete reaction. Despite that, when I look in there, when I'm rotating the blades, I see the carbon in there, like, moving and powdering up, but I can't get it out no matter what I do. Um, even at max voltage of this motor, going back and forth, I'm just going to end up damaging something, so it's whatever. I just have to do another run, get it nice and hot again, do a complete run, and then it'll get out just fine. And like I said before, in the reactor, I didn't see not one bit of styrofoam anywhere. Everything I saw in there was carbon, but of course, it could have just been, like, a molten pool of it at the bottom that just kind of solidified so there's no telling look at that okay you know what something I noticed about this right away this is actually just oil there's no water in here you know like when we did LDPE now the LDPE did have some moisture on it before we put it in there but there was some water in the oil this is just pure oil one pound of the um, styrofoam yielded 200 mil of pure oil. So when we did the LDPE run, it was two pounds of that stuff. So we had assumed two pounds of this stuff would yield about 400 mil, right? Um, as we see, this has a low viscosity, has a nice golden undertone color. There's that little, there's that black cover of it. That's I think colloidal or dissolved carbon. It's in every oil I get from pyrolysis, no matter what I do. Um, but despite that, the viscosity looks really good. Let's see how she burns. Have me a little plasma arc lighter here, and this kind of represents the spark plug. So, like, if this can light it, most likely a gasoline engine will be able to light it, more than likely. So, we're gonna put some in this little dish here. And I will move this completely out the way for safety. Don't need to start a fire. It does not light. It's light to a flame. No. Who knows exactly what this could, what the composition of this could be. Like, maybe I, there was some water in there and I just put the water fraction on top. It did kind of pool up at the top there, so maybe I did just put, you know, a potential water fraction, a little bit of water. Oh, that lit. Okay. I think I did just put some water in there. Water in here. That pulled up. Does light quite easily. All right. Well, I would reckon that stuff is pretty akin to gasoline. So I was wrong. There was a very, very small amount of water. Um, it's hardly even visible at the very bottom, like barely any. Um, which you know makes sense why there would be some water in there. You know, if there's any moisture at content in the styrofoam at all, it's going to come out here. Um, so there's a very small amount that makes sense because when I pulled it with my pipette I pulled it from the bottom assuming there was no water in here out of that whole run We only filled up about one yoga ball. So um, The star from clearly produces more oil per weight Than gas compared to LDPE, you know, like I said, we only put a pound in there compared to two pounds of LDPE So we would have gotten more oil from two pounds of star from than we got from the two pounds of LDPE um only one ball full of gas, but once again, this gas is nice and flammable. Um, unnatural gas, as I call it. It is a beautiful flame. Um, I already compressed it before my last video, so I'm not going to show you me compressing this. Uh, but, you know, we don't know the exact composition, but to me, it's all kind of a similar thing. Probably mostly methane in here with some other hydrocarbons, maybe some potential styrenes. 
What's up guys? So I want to do a test. I want to do a little test, yeah. Um, of this oil we got. I want to see if in its current state, no distillation, no filtering, no centrifuge, if it can run an engine. So I have an engine here, two stroke steel weed whacker, good engine. We're going to go ahead and start it just to prove it works. Right now this has gasoline plus two stroke oil in it. So when, once it works, we're going to pump out all the gasoline or pour it out and run it until it stops and then put some of the pyrolysis oil in there. So that's how much that was in there. Now we will we'll start it and then let it kind of, you know, choke itself out. Alright, she choked herself out. Now I know I said no filters, but I am going to use this little filter here just to catch any big debris, right? It will remain relatively raw. 20, okay, so this is going to come out to be about 28 mil of pyrolysis oil from styrofoam. See how much that is? Now this is a two-stroke engine, so we'll need two-stroke oil. But I'm going to see if it'll just run first. If it runs, then we'll add the two-stroke oil. If it doesn't run, then obviously I don't have to worry about having to deal with that. Alright, so I don't know if you can see, but there is some oil in that tank there. You see that? Yep, there's some pyrolysis oil. So let's see if she starts. She did run. She was stalling a little bit, a little bit of smoke out of the exhaust. Let's add some more of the pyrolysis oil and add some engine oil. I'm not even going to bother with the filter this time around. A couple drops of this, uh, this two-stroke engine oil, and we'll shake it around in there. So you can see it in there at the bottom. So this test is really to see the pyrolysis oil's purity before distillation. We know with distillation it will run an engine just fine. We already did that before, but we want to see um, prior to distillation how well it runs an engine. Let's go! Unfiltered, undistilled, all uncleaned, but it still runs a gasoline engine. Beautiful. You love to see it.